All right, everybody. Hey, don't be feel shy. If you want, you can move up front. Yeah, you over there. Let's move up front. There. Anyway, there's 10,000 yen into the sea. Uh, this flipper. Let's uh, give him a big hand and say something like, "Woo! Come on! Awesome!" Hello. Um, so, as he said, I'm Flipper. Uh, this is my talk, 10,000 yen into the sea. Um, essentially, well, I mean, just to start with, uh, can I get a show of hands? Uh, who enjoys filling up their gas tank? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it either. Actually, uh, I spent four years commuting uh, to and from my community college, uh, four years, two year program. I had other things to do. Um, so, it was a 45 minute drive each way, so I pretty much ended up putting about as much money into my tank as I uh, saved by living in my parents' basement. So uh, all the benefits of living in my parents' basement with none of the cost savings. So that was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, and the reason why this is relevant is uh, shortly after college, I saw underwater gliders and they kind of blew me away because uh, when you see the uh, typical range and uh, duration of these things missions, uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, around 3,000 kilometers on a single battery pack charge and I work with electric vehicles professionally, uh, partially as a consequence of this project and I got to say if you can show me a Nissan Leaf that can go 3,000 kilometers I'll be pretty impressed. Um, One of my coworkers says it's all about the drive cycle. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, I'm Flipper, and um, this is kind of what I do: uh, electric vehicles. Uh, professionally, they're ground vehicles here uh, underwater. Um, I keep on trying to talk my boss into let me uh, uh, turn one of our vehicles into a submarine, but so far, no such luck. Um, so. You know, I'm finished with my education and uh, not much in the way of job options at the time, uh, kind of dead-end jobs, and uh, I'm killing time in the bathroom because uh, I didn't really like my job. Reading the Oregonian, and I see an article on Oregon State University's underwater glider program, and, you know, they were talking about how they work, they show a little cutaway diagram, and I'm kind of blown away. It's all like, wait, 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 like how much do these cost? I could do that, you know, $100 tops. So that's where the 10,000 yen comes from is uh, at one point in history that was about $100. Um, a little bit of Jules Verne's too. So um, in order to build an underwater glider for uh, $100, you kind of have to be an engineer, you know, or hacker, one of the two. Uh, I definitely wasn't an engineer, so I guess that's why I'm here at DEF CON with you guys. Um, so. Uh, you know, how do you uh, design an underwater glider? You have to uh, learn how to design an underwater glider. So uh, it was really the start of an education, uh, you know, self-taught uh, in design and manufacture of underwater vehicles. So I um, was studying machine tool technology at the time, manufacturing engineering type stuff, eventually got a transfer degree. And um, so yeah, uh, it was a great vehicle to actually learn and uh, gave a really good incentive to you know study STEM subject matter and uh, ultimately uh, transitioned into an interest in an engineering transfer degree. So what is an underwater glider? Um, normal underwater vehicles uh, propel themselves through the water using a propeller. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, there's no propeller on an underwater glider, generally speaking. Uh, they use something similar to a fish's swim bladder to change buoyancy in the water and as they float to the surface they have wings on them. Does this thing work? Apparently not. So wings uh, and those actually help uh, transfer the change in altitude into uh, forward movement and so uh, the efficiency of the vehicle is going to be determined by a couple things. Um, first of all the efficiency of your fish bladder buoyancy engine uh, your drag, big factor is your drag. And then um, also uh, kind of related to drag is your glide ratio. Uh, how many feet forward you move through the water for every uh, foot you lose or gain in altitude. One interesting thing of underwater vehicles is they spend about half the time flying upside down because, uh, you know, your gravity uh, vector 
flips uh, its head when you uh, are going against uh, the water column or going down with it. So yeah, there are uh, autonomous underwater vehicles that can travel long distances on battery power. So history, you know, it all started back in, uh, you know, 80s or something. I wasn't even born yet, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, very egocentric view of the universe. Um, so they had these things called Argos floats, and they were essentially, you know, a coffee can with a big uh, linear motor powered syringe, and uh, they'd go down through the water column and they'd collect sensor data, and then when they had enough data, they'd float back to the surface, you know, satellite modem, phone home, and uh, then they'd do it all over again. And um, based on my understanding of how things went down, uh, one person was like, well, these things are really cool. You know, we're getting really good data. We're, uh, we're not having to send people out in boats at, you know, $40,000 a day. Um, but the problem is we can't actually control where they go. They're kind of like hot air balloons. So it was like, what if we strap wings on them? And underwater gliders were born. Um, Henry Stommel was one of the uh, people who wrote some uh, kind of pioneering articles on the potential applications of these things. And um, what you uh, see before you today uh, between the Scarlet Knight, the Slocum, the Spray, uh, it's become a very popular uh, vehicle class simply because of the range you can cover uh, for the amount of energy you have to store. So um, the Scarlet Knight is one of the record holders. Uh, it was put together by Rutgers University and it was essentially a uh, a uh, Slocum glider that had been, you know, loaded down with extra battery mass and stretched out a little bit. Uh, uses lithium CSC cells, is my understanding, which is kind of impressive because the uh, high test peroxide uh, rocket fuel you see in the movie Moonraker, uh, as far as I can tell, actually has lower energy density. So those are pretty impressive batteries, although also fairly expensive. Uh, that's not what I ended up using. So, um, I don't know if this is the correct way to design an underwater glider, but you know, after going through you know 10, 20 uh, designs in my head before even trying to build the first draft, uh, this is kind of what I settled on as the proper procedure. Um, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you don't really know how you can package your components until you know what your components are, and buoyancy engine being one of the key elements that's going to determine the efficiency. You really have to start with that. Um, Energy storage system is going to be dictated by the energy requirements of your buoyancy and uh, then, you know, whole design. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process, very few moving parts. So um, eventually I did, you know, I'm not a very de de decisive person, but eventually I did, you know, come to a conclusion on how I wanted to build one of these things and that was with a phase change material. Um, there's uh, another vehicle out there that uses uh, PCMs uh, to propel itself through the water, it's called the Slocum Thermal. Um, and uh, I'm not doing that because it looked really expensive. Uh, I read some NASA, NASA tech briefs uh, kind of talking about that concept and I think it was like N pentadecane was the alkane they used and really expensive per ounce, wasn't really on the table because my goal going into this was, remember, I said I could do this for $100. If I'm spending, you know, $200 on my, uh, my phase change material, I'm kind of already blown out. So um, these were the design requirements I went into it with. Um, I wanted the, you know, barriers to entry to be super low because even though I had access to a milling machine and a lathe, not everybody does. So uh, I wanted, you know, all of you to be able to take your DEF CON CD uh, take the solid models that are on there and uh, go home and build one of these yourself. Um, and then, you know, range of efficiency, you're not going to take a two order of magnitude reduction in cost without, you know, taking some hits on range, efficiency, performance. So it was kind of a best effort basis. Um, I'm, uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I've, uh, I've got a fairly large battery pack uh, compared to the currency or compared to the uh, current consumption I'm looking at. So, um, We'll see. Here's one of the earlier efforts uh, I made into actually trying to uh, uh, design for manufacture. That's a, that's a Harbor Freight air compressor gear uh, being used to uh, index several syringes. Um, and uh, this design actually served as a little bit of inspiration for uh, a hack I had to make towards the end of this project. Um, overall, the, uh, the check valves involved were uh, kind of a prohibitive feature that just disillusioned me of this concept. So 
considered a lot of things. I struck out electric motors, linear actuators pretty early on in the process because, you know, at the time, you know, lathe and milling machine were pretty much, you know, a requirement to make those happen. Um, the weight of using an off-the-shelf linear actuator was pretty massive. You'd end up with like a scuba tank pressure housing and that's no fun. So, uh, wave and solar power, um, interesting concepts. I'd like to explore them a little bit, um, especially for one concept I might mention at the end. But uh, overall, hydraulic uh, pumps and um, phase change materials kind of showed out to me as the best choices available. So, um, paraffin wax expands 10% when it melts ish. Um, and uh, it's got a very high specific heat. Um, so, uh, when it does melt, it'll stay liquid for a very long time. So, um, I was looking at using soldering irons as a resistive load to actually melt the wax. And um, this is just a kind of a breakdown comparison of uh, various energy densities I was looking at for um, kind of guiding my decision on how to build the buoyancy engine. Um, and when I first started on this project, there really wasn't much in the way available of low cost uh, inertial navigation. Um, you had the multi Wii project, which uh, I thought was pretty genius. They took a nunchuck and a motion plus from a Wii game console and uh, they actually made a six degree of freedom IMU out of it. Um, welcome to the future. This is really cool. This is a $33 board available from Hobby King and I can't imagine they have more than, you know, $5 of profit margin built into that. Um, you get a really cutting edge chip on there called the MPU 6050 or 6000 one of the two, depending on if it's SPI or ITC. But the point is, it's got a built-in magnetometer, and so it can do complete nine degree of freedom um, sensor fusion, which is the ability to distinguish between gravity and uh, linear movement uh, through space. And when you're trying to actually integrate uh, your inertial um, data, uh, you'll run into problems unless you have some pretty uh, good math background or a fantastic product like this behind you. Um, that's the 3DR Robotics uh, GPS chip. Um, it was available and it's actually buried in the nose cone of my vehicle right now, um, coated in a nice thick goop of RTV compound. Um, hull design was kind of fun. I spent most of the past year working on that at a specific aspect because it ultimately guided the production of the rest of the vehicle. Once I knew what I was packaging, I had to actually wrap it up into some sort of uh, fluid dynamic whole form. And so based on the research I had, I'd heard some interesting things about, you know, 30 to 1 glide ratios with uh, something called a McMaster's airfoil, which is pretty much a NACA uh, four-digit series uh, 0030. Um, but um, based on uh, the uh, simulations I did using a program called uh, Profili 2 marketed at RC Plane Design, um, it, its main claim to fame was it didn't stall out at uh, high angles of attack, um, whereas uh, the black line uh, has one of the sharpest peaks on there. So NACA 009 or 0009 uh, was kind of out of the question too. So kind of middle of the road choice uh, of the symmetric airfoils that were well understood at the time. Uh, pretty common options are, uh, you know, NACA 0015-ish. So um, I think my wing route is uh, NACA 0015 and uh, wing tip is NACA 002. And uh, what that does is hopefully like the Rutan Long Easy, um, if you end up stalling out, uh, the wing root stalls before the wing tips and that'll cause the, uh, the pitch to self-correct. Um, fingers crossed on that. Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, testing in that regard. So first concept, I took a uh, polycarbonate tube uh, a wax motor used to control a dishwasher latch, funny enough, high force, uh, high latency, uh, low efficiency, unfortunately, as I found out later. Um, and, oh no, I, I'm not sure if I'd submitted my CFP at this point, but I was kind of sweating at that time because uh, I'm apparently really, really bad at fiberglass. Uh, who knew? Uh, <laughs> the original idea was is that I would uh, be using hot wire foam cutting techniques to actually generate the whole form and then uh, lay fiberglass over it. And uh, as you can see from this picture, that wasn't going so hot. So not as easy as it looked on YouTube. Uh, was not going to hit my deadline at that rate. So throw money at the problem. Um, I've generally found that when time is of the essence, money can generally buy you time back. So I bought a 3D printer. 
I really am happy I made that decision. 3D printers are really cool. Um, one of the design requirements being able to build this thing in my underwear, check. So uh, similar design, uh, same whole form, uh, but now broken into smaller chunks to help with the print volume and also uh, you know, trying to minimize the, uh, the overhang of the printed parts. Support material is an option and one of the largest prints on there actually was using support material, but um, one month turnaround time, you really can't argue with that. And um, I, I knew 3D printing could really help expedite the design process and getting you through multiple iterations. But until I'd experienced it firsthand, kind of saving my bacon on getting a proof of concept out the door and second, third revision, whatever, um, I, I was incredibly impressed with the value. Uh, that 3D printer I showed was a Rostock Max. It's a Delta Bot style design. And they are one of the coolest to look at when they're running. Um, Cartesian bots a little bit lame, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, and that's the uh, that's the robot you see in front of you. So, um, hundred dollar price target, uh, thirty one dollars uh, a kilogram for my plastic. That could be cheaper, but let's you know try and be generous just to uh, make sure I don't underestimate. Uh, so twenty one dollars in plastic. So if you throw uh, a significant amount of capital investment at the pro uh, prospect of building injection molding tooling, then that could come down significantly. Um, remaining bill of material was actually uh, published to the DVD, if I remember correctly. And uh, I mentioned there may have been some hiccups along the road. This uh, bill of material is definitely not accurate to the 30 cent mark because the, uh, the phase change material concept ended up working out to not just moderately inefficient to virtually unworkable, at least with the energy storage system I selected. If you need your robot to go to the bottom of the Marias Trench, the fact that it's a solid to liquid phase change as opposed to expansion and contraction of a gas really work into your advantage. But if you're going for range and you don't particularly want to be dragging bottom with seaweed, um, trying to you know get 3,000 meters depth with uh, that process, probably not the most efficient use of battery storage. So. Um, I think it was early May when I realized, uh, wow, uh, I've got, you know, a 200 volt pack or whatever and it's browning out at 100 milliamps, 0.1 amps. Um, I knew that, you know, coin cells weren't exactly like lithium polymer or RC plane batteries, but I was a little bit blown away. Um, so I needed a plan B or plan C, I guess. Uh, so it's what I came up with was uh, something a little bit more conventional, you know, trying to avoid too many experimental, you know, wild concepts in one vehicle build can uh, be a lifesaver. So I went to the tried and true electric motor linear actuator because if you remember at the time, my perception was those weren't really an option because people wouldn't have access to a lathe and mill. But with a 3D printer, that potentially changes. So I ended up using a uh, commercial off the shelf McMaster car parts to uh, build the assembly, which you can see in white on the actual robot now. what's on your DVD and what actually is here in front of you is the white assembly. Uh, everything else I was able to recycle between designs. Uh, so modular design is a good thing, I guess. The gray pipe was a really good choice. It'll Sorry about that. The gray pipe was a really good choice because it allowed for uh, writing, routing of the wiring and um, ultimately acted as kind of a skeleton or a backbone for the entire vehicle. Um, so uh, what I learned from that process is 3D printing is awesome and um, the great thing is when you're actually done with it, you don't have to go through an entire, you know, twisted new process to design 3D printed or injection molded parts. You're practically already there when you have a working prototype. Um, what did I learned through the process, I feel like I actually hit a pretty good balance between fail early, fail often and not making stupid mistakes for lack of planning. Uh, I didn't build anything before I had complete solid model data um, and that's really valuable when you're trying to avoid, you know, these last minute crazed runs to Home Depot, West Marine, AutoZone, whatever it is. If you have a complete bill of materials before you make the first part, you know exactly what's going into the thing and you don't find yourself running into these issues where parts are col uh, colliding with each other. Um, so, and then it was also extremely difficult to quantify whether or not a design decision was a good or a bad one, such as the wax motor, until actually trying it. So, um, it was a design decision trade-off to not use so much simulation. 
Um, and I was pretty happy with how that went because you can simulate the daylights out of a bad idea and then find out, you know, you wasted the last year doing, you know, uh, FEA or um, CFD on a broken design and then it's all wasted. So prototypes can illuminate things that you otherwise wouldn't uh, be aware of. Um, so I did this entire thing out of pocket. Um, no, uh, no grants or funding agencies and I, I actually really like that because um, I'm accountable to myself and uh, I don't have anybody breathing down my neck forcing me to, you know, chase sunk costs or uh, make bad decisions because, oh, I need to save face over that, you know, thousand dollars I wasted on, you know, wax motors. Um, on the other hand, uh, I gave pretty much the profit of the design away for free on the DVD this year. I've probably spent around 15 grand on the project over the past decade. And um, so I would consider it a dubious appropriation of my retirement savings. Um, but, you know, that was the mission from the start. I wanted people to be able to build these themselves and um, kind of uh, empower themselves to uh, deliver sensors, uh, communications devices, and payloads to remote destinations where traditionally uh, it would be prohibitively expensive at, you know, uh, tens of thousands of dollars per vehicle. Um, and how that's possible is if your price is low enough, you can consider it disposable and you don't have to pay somebody 40 grand to go out in the water and change the batteries. So uh, we'll see. Uh, ultimately, if you build it, they will come. And uh, if it's a good idea, hopefully people will say, hey, maybe we should build some of these. So where to go from here? Um, I didn't have an opportunity to test max depth um, because I only had one prototype uh, as of two weeks ago. And I didn't really want to lose it out in the ocean scuba diving. Like, I guess I could have like tried to put a dog collar on it and, you know, walked it like uh, with a leash. But uh, overall, it's disposable after my talk is over. <laughs> but <laughs> thing took over, you know, 100 hours to print. And actually, uh, that guy right there uh, put in a significant amount of labor uh, helping getting this thing ready for your guys' eyes. So um, small applause for him if you're willing. Thanks, guys. Um, so uh, in terms of tri uh, trimming vehicle, I can say with high degree of certainty, this thing is very positively buoyant. Um, traditional uh, buoyancy foam, uh, polyurethane or epoxy and glass micro balloons. Uh, high crush depth, kind of unnecessary seeing as how I designed the vehicle with syringes. Um, but overall, a good choice. So um, Generally speaking, epoxy or urethane, I chose paraffin wax. It's low cost and over half the, uh, the dollar per pound of buoyancy uh, I was seeing was either epoxy or polyurethane. So paraffin wax is like $4 a pound. Um, so very positively buoyant. Every empty cavity in that entire thing has a specific gravity of about 0.5. So it's really just a matter of how you distribute your lead and batteries at this point to uh, make sure that uh, when the buoyancy engine's in a neutral position, it's sitting about horizontal. Um, cause when the vehicle goes buoyant, uh, the center of buoyancy moves forward on the vehicle and it pitches, uh, towards the surface and the GPS chip starts, uh, rising up to it's the, uh, daylight. And when it goes negatively buoyant, the opposite happens. Uh, so, uh, if you're in neutral buoyancy, you should be sitting around level in the water. And, um, it's really just a matter of, uh, adding weight and, removing buoyancy foam as necessary to achieve that. Uh, I'm looking at around 40 to 50 milliliters of uh, displacement change. So uh, it's unknown at this time uh, what the, uh, the vehicle's velocity through the water is. The more buoyant it is, the faster it's going to pop to the surface like a cork. And uh, your speed through the water is going to determine uh, what the Reynolds number is. Uh, and that guides, you know, things like uh, what airfoil you select. But um, First draft, uh, I'd call it an alpha uh, stage design and openglider.com is where I'm going to be uh, adding future revisions. Uh, the one on your CD is Rev 0.1 and uh, Rev 0.2 will be on openglider.com tonight and that will have the new uh, white syringe based assembly. Um, so yeah. Um, in terms of uh, research that went into this, uh, this guy named Bruce Carmichael uh, was one of the pioneers of uh, 
uh, the uh, the airfoil you see before you. Uh, it's called the X-35, and originally it was known as the Dolphin, but uh, if I understand correctly, they ran the Dolphin through a genetic algorithm, uh, and ultimately uh, the citation uh, shaping of asymmetric bodies for minimum drag, that one, uh, I think was where I was able to find the coordinates for this design. Um, it does bear some resemblance to some other uh, vehicles on the market, and that shouldn't be too surprising seeing as, uh, as far as I can tell, we did use the same uh, uh, curve uh, uh, rotate around its axis to uh, generate the main body. Um, otherwise, um, the NAC of four digit series, pretty uh, pretty common equation. And I threw something in here uh, that I found really fascinating. Uh, it's the uh, geometry of a blended wing body morphing wing. Um, and that was the idea that you could actually design an entire vehicle uh, around variables and equations. So you can change something like uh, a static uh, wing sweep from 30 degrees to 15 to 25 degrees and rather than having a lot of uh, hard engineering labor going into remaking the entire design, uh, it just regenerates itself. So uh, very early on in the process I was trying to stick to that concept and uh, I was pretty pleased. Uh, I would change a variable from like uh, NACA four digit, you know, 002 to NACA 005, you know, kind of crazy and, uh, you know, hit rebuild and the model would you know, regenerate itself with li very little labor on my part. Um, one thing I'd like to explore is potentially even doing uh, a genetic algorithm around that concept to uh, optimize for uh, parameters like uh, uh, speed through the water column and uh, uh, lift to drag ratio. So um, that's pretty much how I got here. The X35 took me like six months to a year to even find. I had no idea where people were getting this uh, this curve from, but I saw it in several places. Uh, ultimately, it was just a mad Google foo that uh, was able to uh, illuminate the uh, the coordinates to build this thing. And um, in terms of uh, other information on uh, how to build an underwater vehicle, um, I was going to joke, uh, you know, every story hero has a favorite weapon. Um, Brock Sampson's Bowie knife, um, Will Smith's uh, little cricket, and Flipper's hot glue gun. Uh, <laughs> when you're trying to waterproof stuff, I've tried a lot of different things, conformal coat, um, uh, epoxy potting, uh, pressure housings, and overall, uh, even paraffin wax actually, uh, you know, it's not going to do very good in the Caribbean where the water gets damn near uh, 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and so, uh, but it does a pretty good job because when you pot your electronics and epoxy, it's very difficult to actually recover them or repair them if something blows up. But uh, when you're using paraffin wax, the uh, the 80 degree C melting temperature is actually below the rated temperature for most electronics. So if you uh, decide you want to change something about them, and I've had to, uh, you can just use a hot air gun or boiling water to uh, uh, rescue your electronics. Um, that said, from a durability standpoint, paraffin wax, uh, even if you anneal it with a little bit of mineral oil, uh, not the most durable thing ever. Um, so ultimately hot glue has been my favorite approach to waterproofing. And if you need something a little bit lower viscosity, get you know down in the English muffin nooks and crannies, then um, they make uh, low viscosity silicone RTV. Uh, the acetic acid can potentially corrode your electrical contacts, but we're talking about disposable vehicles here. It doesn't have to last three years. Uh, I've got electronic speed controllers I potted for the RoboSpub uh, competition two years ago that still work. And that was just, you know, plain Jane AutoZone RTV compound. Um, and so uh, pretty much every piece of electronics on that thing are just either coated in hot glue or RTV compound. And it's a pretty easy, low-cost way of waterproofing electronics. Um, so uh, I guess at this time uh, would be a good way to go for questions. Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the problems with underwater vehicles that uh, makes some kind of interesting to me is uh, unlike, you know, Mars rovers, you know, easy environment, uh, you know, aerial vehicles, a bunch of lightweights, you know, these people, they're so spoiled. Uh, with uh, underwater vehicles, you don't get to talk to your robot after you let it go. 
until it comes back to the surface, at which point, you know, it's kind of a surface vehicle until it goes back underwater, snorkel depth style. So uh, no radio frequency communication, so it has to be pretty much all autonomous. And the source code uh, I used with the IMU to actually, um, it's called a Haversign formula. It uh, finds your current GPS coordinates and your destination GPS coordinates and gives you a bearing. And uh, the distance you need to go to get there. So it's pretty much a line follower robot. That's what makes underwater gliders potentially so successful is unlike, you know, mine detecting robots um, or, you know, anti-frogmen stuff. Uh, they have a pretty basic mission, which is go from point A to point B. So object avoidance potentially with sonar, but, you know, suddenly when your payload starts getting into the, you know, high dollar sonar stuff, it stops being so disposable. And at that point, you know, my 3D printed, uh, open glider may not be the best choice of vehicles. Um, so testing has been kind of an iterative process. Uh, I've learned every time I stuck it in the bathtub. Um, early on, uh, it was pretty much with a small car battery and some uh, red and green wire hanging out, hanging out of the thing. Uh, underwater vehicles can actually be communicated with remotely uh, using something called a tether. Uh, at which point they're no longer AUVs or UUVs, they're ROVs, uh, remotely operated vehicles. And I had two years of tethered vehicle competitions that kind of prepared me for uh, working with uh, the unmanned side of things. And um, it's, uh, it's a pretty good way to go. Um, so for testing, uh, bathtubs are surprisingly effective. You have them in hotel rooms. Um, and <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, generally speaking, the main thing you're going to be testing is either uh, what it decides to do when it gets in the water or uh, how it sits in the water when you put it in there. And both of those things don't require a big swimming pool. Uh, also, a, a lot less uh, terrified, shrieking uh, swimmers running away from the, uh, the evil robot. It's the second one. Um, so I don't really rely on um, pressure housings as a rule. Uh, I had to depend on um, some amount of air cavity uh, for the design fix. Uh, and it's the most conventional thing about this design was uh, you've got little linear actuators driven by three volt uh, gear motors. Actually, I think I have one. Anybody want one? I, I know audiences love things being thrown at them. Not you, Mark. Um, oh, hey, speaking of that, uh, anybody want a flight controller? $33 give me? Remember, two is one, one is none, so bring spare parts. Oop. Sorry. I throw like a roboticist. Um, uh, more questions? Oh, good question. So uh, when you have like a tank light when you're scuba diving, you can actually make them water activated so they are only wasting battery life when you're in the water and you're trying not to lose your dive buddy. Um, in my case, uh, I don't have anything smart like that on my robot. So those wires allow me to disconnect the power supply from the actual microcontroller because once I plug it in, it just goes and it'll keep going until I unplug it. Ooh, really good question. I was at an ROV conference and uh, this guy who was like super salty, you know, had been out in the field for a long time, told me a really cool trick. Um, you go to like Harbor Freight and they'll sell these uh, heat shrink packages, marine heat shrink, and it's just heat shrink that's been lined with hot glue. And you don't need to use special heat, heat shrink or wire crimps. You can just take your wire splice, coat it in hot glue, and then run heat shrink over it. And when you melt the heat shrink or, you know, uh, shrink the heat shrink, it'll uh, melt the hot glue again and pull all the air bubbles out. Great question. How is it what? Oh, yeah, no, I totally glossed over on that. Really good point. Um, so I don't actually have one buoyancy engine, I have four. Um, and generally speaking, you might have them towards the top of the vehicle. I have them uh, low on the center of gravity because uh, I had two places I could put them top or uh, bottom and uh, the top was all being used by syntactic foam uh, or syntactic wax, buoyancy sand. Um, and uh, since that was more buoyant than the buoyancy engines themselves, uh, I had them down low. And so I have broken the cross section of my vehicle 
into um, eight little slices of pie. Uh, the top four are full of buoyancy sand and the bottom four uh, there are uh, two pairs. So when you trigger the two on the left, your uh, left side is going to be more buoyant than uh, your right side. So one wing will lift up. Uh, and it, likewise, if you use the two on the right, it's going to uh, change the attitude the other way. Um, so this is one unique thing about my vehicle design. Uh, traditional, traditionally, you actually move your battery mass, whereas I'm just having uh, four times the buoyancy engines that are typical. And finally, you know, if you, uh, you change buoyancy on the bottom two, then you'll just go straight. Oh, good question. Um, so I can say with pretty good confidence that my inertial navigation system is not, you know, high enough quality to be U.S. munitions list uh, grade. So uh, that's uh, that's totally a relief. Uh, yeah, these are hobby components. So um, video game grade. Uh, in terms of actual uh, like uh, integration of my, you know, velocity or you know whatever to get my position, uh, I don't really do any of that. Um, I've been working a little bit in my free time with uh, trying to uh, use fetal Doppler monitors, which measure the velocity of fluid uh, through a uh, baby's blood uh, to, uh, you know, let you listen to the kid's heartbeat. Kind of cool. Um, and they're essentially uh, homodynes, ultrasonic homodynes. And uh, I've been looking at potentially getting some velocity information from that. But pretty much I figure out which direction I want to go. And it's a line follower bot. It says, I know I need to go either left, right, or straight. And it dives and it comes to the surface and it says, oh, wow, I missed my target, but okay, now I need to go. You know, it doesn't really look backwards, only forwards. Good question. Thanks. Uh, how do you have Ooh, bathtub depth. <laughs> Okay, originally um, I had a washing machine wax motor uh, from like a, I think it was a Whirlpool Neptune or something. Um, and uh, that one didn't get a lot of uh, uh, mileage simply because the fiberglass thing went so terrible. Uh, it just didn't really work into the 3D printed picture. So then I moved to a soldering iron based design. Uh, I was using silicone high temperature uh, rubber hose and soldering irons and filling them with wax. and. Um, uh, I was browning out my power supply, even though I only needed about 100 milliamps, it was still uh, too much and uh, it would have been a pretty big design tear up to change my batteries, so I just changed my buoyancy engine. Questions? Really good question. So in the original solid model I designed around, uh, I actually uh, made a solid model of the PX4 autopilot from DIY drones or, you know, PX, I don't really know that, what that relationship is, but it's a really good board. Uh, it uses a publisher subscriber system. Um, and so right now I'm only using the, um, the IMU, the micro Wii board for everything. And um, one of the issues with uh, that decision is, uh, it is so flash memory constrained that you can only just barely compile the source code and include it on your DVD. In fact, if you try and use Arduino 1.5.2 to do so, it's not going to work for you. You have to use uh, Arduino 1.0.4, if I remember correctly, and that will work. So I uh, didn't remember to put that into the slides, and I'm glad you brought it up. So there is a reasonable amount of uh, space uh, about one quarter of the size of an Altoid 10, maybe half the size of an Altoid 10 for, you know, a supervisory controller to supplement the IMU. The IMU is broadcasting yaw, pitch, roll information uh, that's already been fused. So it's pretty much relative to your world body uh, or world coordinate system. And uh, it's really nice because it's uh, publishing it on the serial port and uh, it's also telling you, oops, time's up. All right, um, any further questions uh, or uh, wanting to see the robot in person, you know, touch and feel, uh, I'll meet you guys out in the hallway, I guess.